Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Higher Hertz Cello Lessons. I'm Justin Leopard, your online cello teacher. Today, I want to talk about how to read sheet music for beginner cellists. How do you know what notes are being played? How do you interpret the notes on the page? How do you learn sheet music on your own? We're just going to go over the basics here. So I have in front of me on the computer uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We're just going to start with. We've worked on that piece the last video. And so you can see here represented are the things that we talked about. We had talked about the two notes that repeat per note. We talked about what notes those are. So what we will observe first is uh, we'll just go kind of left to right. All sheet music is going to have some sort of indication of what the clef is. And that's uh, that's this guy here. So you know, cellos typically will read bass clef, although we also will read two other clefs, tenor and treble. So eventually you'll need to learn those, although for beginner cello music, that will pretty much all be in bass clef. And bass clef always looks like this. It's got the little hook on it. And fun fact, it's also called F clef because it, the two little dots that you can see surround a line and that line is F. So clefs used to have names like this um, so that you, know, you could have this lower by a stem and then they would have made the center F. Um, nowadays, there's just one F clef and it is this one, the bass clef. So the open strings on the cello luckily somewhat correspond to the notes that we see on screen. For example, the first note D is the middle line of the five lines of the staff. So, you know, you can kind of think of it as if you forget C string for a second, just think about it, the top three strings, they correspond to the top line, the middle line, and the bottom line of the, the F clef, of the bass clef. Um, so that's really convenient. So when you see these two notes uh, on the open strings, or sorry, on the middle middle line and on the top line, you know those are open strings. So just like we already know. So let's continue going. Uh, let's continue going left here. We we kind of skipped ahead a little bit. Uh, what we've got right there is the key signature. So you'll notice that on every single staff, we actually have that repeated. Basically to save time, to save space, instead of marking every single time that a note differs from the one that you would expect on the staff, we put those in advance. So in D major, the only notes that will need sharps or flats are C sharp and F sharp too. So you can see, you know, we just said that this is F clef. So on that line, we've got the first sharp and then we've got the other one and that is C sharp. So this way, all the way through, we know, uh, and this is how we think of it in cello terms, that the middle line, uh, or the second from the top line, which means uh, F, is going to be sharp. And so sharp means a half step higher, flat means a half step lower. So if we didn't see anything, we would assume F, F natural. Natural is implied if it doesn't have the other one. So that would be what we would assume, but we have the F sharp, which if you've watched the other video on scales, you know, is what makes it D major. These two notes are what makes it D major because we have the sharp third we also have the raised leading tone. So if we're playing D minor, we're even still gonna use that just so we know it's D. So that's what sharps and flats are. Uh, you can also end up seeing sharps and flats anywhere throughout the score, but a key signature is gonna be the shorthand, both for saving space in the score for the publisher, especially back in the day when we were marking it, but also as a shorthand of the performer, because if you learn, and it takes a while to learn, but if you learn to just intuitively see two sharps D major, don't even have to think about it, uh, that saves you time. Also two sharps could be B minor. You have to know that. Then you look at the notes and you figure it out. Uh, okay, so now we are almost done with these these three markings. The final one is this 4-4. Four, four. And you'll notice that one doesn't get repeated on each line. That one is going to be assumed to be continuous uh, unless a different time marker comes up. So what this is doing is it's telling us 
uh, what type of meter or what type of rhythm, uh, rhythm, rhythmic counting is going to be in this piece. So there's always going to be two numbers. The bottom number is what note gets the beat. This one might be a little confusing, but basically uh, a whole note is four beats. Quarter note is a quarter of a whole note. And it's the quarter note that you're going to have to pay attention to. That's what they're telling you at that bottom four, is that it's a quarter note you'll pay attention to. If it said four eight, that would mean you were paying attention to the eighth notes, which happen twice as fast as quarter notes. The top note is how many beats there are in the bar. 4-4 four, four is by far the most common time signature. Pretty much all pop music is in it, and a heck of a lot of classical music is in 4-4-2. Four, four, it could say 3-4, and then it would just be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. But instead it's 4, so it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And these are just beat patterns. Um, you will learn them over time watching conductors, but one is always down. The last beat of the bar is always up, and then you'll do some combination of left, right. So if it's three, two, two. If it's four, one, two, three, four. And if it's two, one, two, one, two. And that's pretty much what you need to know for now. So when we look at this, and we're thinking four beats, so, okay, and then, you know, the way, the tempo that I was playing this yesterday would have this be at a, at a relative, pretty fast tempo, you know, dun, 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 ba, ba, ba. Um, but this is how we're going to know the beat. So what, what we can already do before even playing or before even worrying too much what the notes are, we can already just kind of look at the rhythm and the beats and at least know that. So we, we have these bar lines at the end of every four beat and those mark, you know, where those four beats are. Now, right now, it's not that big of a deal. You could probably remove the bar lines and it would still be intelligible music, but especially when you have more complicated rhythms than Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, it becomes very, very important. So the rest of the notes that are on the cello are, if you have uh, this note, the G, uh, that's fourth finger. The next one down is, is second or third finger, depending on what it is. Uh, the next space down is one. And you might have noticed both spaces and lines are used. So it's not that they're getting marked per line. The lines and the spaces both can contain notes. And they're, they're always going to be uh, different intervals depending on the context, depending on what key it's in, um, and, you know, etc. Now, this piece doesn't show it, but if we were to continue to go down, so the space below the middle note, that would be the fourth finger. The second from the bottom line would be the second and third finger. The lowest space would be the first finger. As we already discussed, the lowest line is G. And then when you get much, much lower, you will see a little extra line that's written below the staff. And this is called a ledger line. So the open C string is actually two ledger lines below the staff. <laughs> And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. So for now, I think we've talked about pretty much everything there is to uh, be able to read about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We see what the clef is, although it's always going to be bass for beginner to cello music. We see what the key is, definitely not always going to be D major. We see the time signature, mostly four, but it's good to pay attention when there's, when there's a three. We've talked about where the notes kind of basically are. And if you get a scale book, it's obviously going to be, you know, easy to start associating the the notes. So, you know, it's good to it's good to practice repertoire by ear, uh, but if you are also practicing your technique from a book, it'll help you learn to read a little bit faster and just associate where these notes are on the cello. So, let's go to a couple I I just pulled up. I literally just went to Google and typed in cello sheet music and these are like the first two that came up. The first one is an arrangement somebody did of Bohemian Rhapsody. This is not my arrangement, but there's a few additional markings that I want to talk about in this. So one is slow rock. You'll often see at the start of music some sort of marking that indicates the feel or the tempo. In this case, it's, it's indicating both. It's saying that it's slow, so it's not going to be like twinkle tempo 4-4. Four, four. It's also saying that it's rock. So you're going to want to use the feel of rock music uh, and the many intricacies that that involves. 
Now, the other symbol that you might notice, there's two. One is this guy, the uh, funky dots. Now, this has a brother. These always come in pairs. This is the first of a repeat sign. And then its brother is down here. And uh, down here, we've actually also got this beam. It says one versus two. So what this is saying is play all the way through until you get to the repeat sign. Go back to the start of the repeat and play. But now when you get to this moment, go to the second ending instead of the first and then continue. Okay, so that's what a repeat sign is and what a first and second ending are. We also in the middle here actually have a key change and it's also accentuated with a double bar line. I think that's the standard for any key change. And now you'll see there's only one sharp and that means that we're in G major after having been in D. Now, I don't remember, anyways, we'll, we'll see how this ends up going. The final marking at the beginning that you'll want to pay attention to is this MF. You'll also see a couple other plot spots on the page is F and then another MF. These are dynamic markings. Dynamics meaning how loud you're going to play. There's two types of dynamic markings. One is it'll tell you what the dynamic is, and that's what it is in this case. So the M means mezzo or medium. The F means forte or loud or strong. It actually means strong, but it means loud. So the, pro the basic dynamics are either loud or soft, forte or piano. Piano uh, actually doesn't mean soft. Uh, it's a complicated reason why the instrument named piano is named piano, but uh, piano, it means soft. So you'll see either F or P, or you'll see MF or MP for like only kind of the way there, or you'll see FF or FFF or PP or PPP when the composer wants you to be exceptionally big or small. And what's nice is you can look, kind of look through the score and see kind of where, so for example, on this first page, there's not anything below mezzo forte. So that means that maybe mezzo forte is even taken with a grain of salt at some times. If you want to play a note a, a little bit less, we also see there's not a huge dynamic range in this. We're mostly playing generally kind of loud, but it starts medium loud. So those are the things that I would take from having seen those right there. Okay. And finally, we have some trickier rhythms. So what we the first note that we have is an eighth note. And then the next note, there's a little dot next to it. And the dot adds half of the value of the note to it. Rhythms, I promise you, get tricky. So just do your best and you will, I promise you will learn them in time. So the second beat starts sometime after this note. And eighth notes, if we're thinking of one, two, three, Four, the eighth notes are t -t 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 -t. there's two eighth notes per quarter note because a quarter is four and an eighth is eight and so this is going to be bum ba ah ba ba da da i mean you probably know the melody it's like the most famous song of all time but when it's represented here what it's just showing you play the eighth note and hold the quarter note for three eighth notes because a quarter note would normally be two eighth notes but you were adding half the value because of the dot so that's three all right following one two three four off two three bum, ba. see how that works so there's eight eighth notes there's four eighth pulses in the first two notes and then we have something that i don't know if we saw in twinkle twinkle which are rests. So you also have to learn rests. So there's every note has a corresponding rest amount. This is a quarter rest and this is an eighth rest. Um, let's see, yeah, down here we've got a half rest and this is a whole rest. And yes, half rests and whole rests look very similar, but in practice, you can pretty much always tell the difference because nothing else will be in the bar with a whole rest. So, you know, what these markings mean are don't play. So we had four eighth notes in the first part of the bar, and then we have a quarter note and an eighth note that we don't play. So if we're thinking in terms of eighth notes, one, two, and off, and four, dun, 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 dun. So here, when we have the additional lines on the eighth note, that means 16th note. So that's how these get shorter. We see lots of 16th notes all around here. And the best way to be able to figure out what the rhythm is, 
is to subdivide. It's called subdivide, where you count all of the smallest divisions that you'll be playing. So if we're talking about 16th notes, that's 16 notes per bar, otherwise known as four per quarter note, four per beat. So if we're thinking one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, then we can go through uh, before we even play and we can just get the rhythm down. So right so i'm accenting where the notes are played and when i play it i'll still be thinking of the 16th notes underneath but i'll only be playing the notes as they are written so when you see something kind of funky looking like this you know that's dun 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 bum bum ba 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 because you're thinking da 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 off key change all right so in, in using this method you would be able to keep going so if we do keep going we will see that Sometimes we have accidentals printed next to the notes. And we haven't talked about this yet, but when you see the accidental, uh, in this case, in this case, the E is flat. So whereas normally you would play, it's, you have to extend your first finger back and play E flat instead. When we see the next note, it has a natural in front of it. Now, up until this point, every time we've seen F, which is that second line from the top, we've had to play F sharp. Now we play F natural, just for that note. Uh, the, the common practice is that um, an, an accidental is good for the duration of a bar. So a great example of this is down here where it says double time, which means to feel it going twice as fast. So in the beginning it was slow rock, but now we're going twice as fast. Um, and here you can see that there's an F natural and then the note next to it does not have an accidental, but it is assumed that it is F natural still until we see F sharp noted, and then this one will also be F sharp. Now, in the next bar, these accidentals don't hold, uh, you know, this. these are still F sharp. It's assumed from the key signature until we hit the F natural again. Here we have a G sharp, which would be extended four, or just half step below first finger in fourth position. Uh, next, we have these um, flats. And, th you know, this is an example of where practicing different scales is going to help you a lot because while these notes could be B flat extended and then A flat extended four, because A flat is actually the same as G sharp earlier. So it's the same. But you could also, if, you're, if you can find the note here, you can play all of these in the same position in this bar. And you'll have to shift in the next bar. But hopefully you can see the general process for sort of decoding what all of this is. I'm a huge fan of decoding in advance of the instrument. If you're sitting down and you're trying to play, it's kind of too late. And I think people who start in school they get it in their head that they're supposed to be able to, and nobody really teaches them how to do it otherwise. And the problem with that is that while, yes, advanced players can sit down and just sight read something, uh, you know, the reality is, is that part of what I'm doing when I do that is there's always some time before you actually have to play. Very rarely uh, is it put the music in front of you and go. You always have a little bit of time. And I'm spending that time scanning. I'm spending that time noticing tricky moments. I'm spending time, if something looks particularly difficult, my eye goes to that and I'm like, what are those notes? Because there's not going to be time when you're actually playing. So this is the process going through it. It's not, it's not a, you know, particularly glamorously studious or it's not over the top. It's just what you do when you get a new piece of music. You want to look through and you want to notice everything that's marked because you don't want to play a wrong note. You want to be informed about how the music is supposed to be played. And most of the time an arranger or composer is putting that information in the best they can to assist you. You know, for example, right here, you have a slur. 
So this line means that you won't retake the bow. You It could play, but he's saying, don't do that because you're gonna get, it's gonna be too accent. He said, you see? So there's all sorts of different markings like that that denote how to play. And then of course, rhythm and rhythm is, is very, very tricky. So finally, I just wanna talk, I know this is a little blurry, but this one did at least, it was like the first result and it does have some things that the other one didn't. So one of the things it has is um, these articulation markings at, this, at the front. Uh, these dots, those mean uh, to play each note separated. It doesn't mean that they have to be exactly short per se. Uh, the marking doesn't intrinsically mean that, although a lot of people will mistake it for that. It just means that they're shorter than the full duration of the beat. So you could also think about this plausibly as being a 16th note and a 16th rest, a 16th note and a 16th rest. And whereas you might play, they're, they're telling you that that's better with that articulation marking. A couple other articulation markings they've got here. Here they have a dot and an accent. So here they're saying, play it short, also give it some extra oomph from the start. Okay, and then some markings that are specific to just the cellist. Above that, we have this uh, kind of bracket looking thing. That's a down bow marking. And this, uh, this V looking thing is an up bow marking. So, you know, they would be saying. Okay. Um, this also has quite a few more just slurs and things to pay attention to. Um, and as you progress, you will encounter markings that you don't necessarily know because truly there are a lot of them. Oh, here's, here's one too that's important to notice. Uh, where is it? it says staccato sim. So, or the stock sim. So that means staccato similarly or simile. Whenever you see sim or simile, it means to continue in the same fashion that you've been playing before. So you'll see on the top line, they've went ahead and they've actually put dots on every single note. But to kind of save print and to save their save the performer's eyes, uh, they, they have not done that the rest of it, but they've said they continue to do that similarly. So those are staccato and markings that say is continue to do that, okay? There's a lot of words like that that you have to learn. Um, looking up just a list of music vocab words can be a helpful crash course in doing that. Otherwise, you know, if you're around people, like a band conductor or something, you can ask as you're playing a cello teacher, you can ask what they are. It's definitely better to try to get to the bottom of what the markings are rather than just not be taking them into consideration at all. And the, the way that this will still get me is if we're reading a symphonic work and it's backed by a German composer, and instead of using the standard music markings, which are mostly Italian based, they'll be using something that's just straight up German, the way that a, you know an American arranger might just write English instead of the fancy musical terms. And then you have to look up what that means because you're not used to seeing et vas Gerard Spander or whatever it is. Um, and so you just have to look that up and it, it says, oh, okay, I, I see, I'm supposed to uh, diminuendo or whatever it is, get quieter. Um, fine, oh, and I forgot to mention that when it comes to dynamics, there's one other type of marking and I don't think we've seen it in any of these, unfortunately, but if you see, um, what looks like an alligator mouth or a hairpin underneath. If it's getting bigger, that means get louder. And if it's coming in, that means get quieter. But that's gonna be the other way, uh, these change in dynamics, that's how those are marked. Okay, so there's been a lot of information to process. Uh, I think the best way to go about learning to read sheet music is study the music that you wanna play, like in advance of playing it. Practice scales, at least occasionally from a scale book, so you can start associating what the notes are and the accidentals and all that stuff. And try to get experience playing so that you encounter the things in the wild that you'll actually use. It could be a bit daunting to crash course every single possible music term and whatever that you'll find in sheet music. Uh, I think it's a good idea to do that, to give yourself some preparation for it, but ultimately it's going to be easier or it's gonna be ultimately the way that you will internalize it is you will realize the things you encounter a lot, like language, like in language, you'll realize the things you encounter a lot and you'll in, you know, encode those in yourself very strongly. And then things you encounter less often, 
you encounter them less often anyway, right? So that's about it. That's about a wrap for this video. There's a lot of information. I highly recommend that you kind of look this up, look up some music terms, try to keep practicing, um, get Suzuki book one or a book of songs that you want to learn on cello, and just spend some time trying to understand every single marking, as well as practicing all the technique and posture and scales that we've talked about. That's it for this video. Uh, please subscribe below, higher hertz, and hit the bell for more cello lesson notifications. Once again, I'm Justin Leopard, and I, you can find some of my playing on The Vagabond Cellist. Uh, we really appreciate you guys watching, and can't wait to see you next time.